So what works when you, you were dealing with terrorist suspects? What works? I mean, are, we, are our hands tied if we're dealing with people who want to kill Americans if we can't do things like waterboard them and, you know, deprive them Listen, of sleep? Listen, but a lot of stuff works. The question shouldn't be, does it work? Rape works. Are we going to start raping people? Sodomy works. We're not going to do that. You mean as torture? I mean to get information or to 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 right, stop. To, to yeah, inter interrogate someone. In right, to torture. You know, we can we can torture their children in front of them. That would work, but we're not going to do that. So the issue is not what works. Lots of different things work. The issue is: is it moral? Is it ethical? Is it legal? And is it going to get us the information that we're going to be able to use to forestall or disrupt future terrorist attacks? Well, and when you're torturing somebody, when you're waterboarding somebody, he's going to tell you exactly what he thinks you want to know to just get you to stop torturing him. But you're going to end up with so much information, 99% of which is going to be false or just made up, and you're going to require a team of analysts and months of time to go through this information and figure out what's true and what's not true. So it doesn't work. It's proven that it doesn't work. Listen, it's hard for me, very hard for me, to compliment the FBI. But one thing that the FBI is really great at is interrogations. They've been doing it since the end of the Second World War when they were interrogating Nazi war criminals. You sit across the table from somebody, you offer him some fruit or a cigarette, you play chess with him, you engage him in a conversation, and over a period of time you build a rapport. And once the rapport is built, he starts talking to you. That's how you get actionable information, not by pouring water on the guy's face. Now, what happened in your case? The case where you confirmed waterboarding was used. Um, you said at first it was just used once on him, and yeah. you got good information. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I the did story say that. Totally changed. Well, the reason the reason I said that is because that's what had been reported back in CIA channels. See, you had a, and we know this thanks to both the Senate torture report and the 2005 CIA Inspector General's report, that the CIA was lying to its own employees inside the headquarters building. These reports that were coming in from the secret prison site, they were fake. They were lies. And they were doing it, the, the two contract uh, psychologists were doing it in order to continue justifying the program. So I said, I, I tried to make a differentiation in that ABC News interview in 2007. I said that it was two separate issues. Was it, did it work and was it legal? And I said that the CIA reporting indicated that it did work because that's what the reporting was indicating. I didn't know that those reports were lies. None of us did. And was it legal? I said I believed it was illegal and that I believed it was torture. The two separate issues. And so what, but what was the result of that? How many times? Well, Abu Zubaydah was waterboarded 83 times. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was waterboarded 147 times. And neither of them provided any actionable information that, that saved any American lives or disrupted any American attacks. It was all a big lie. So why would the CIA lie to you guys? I mean, if you... Because if they, is... they had played their whole hand with this program. This program was a last ditch effort. To, to, to catch these guys and to use their information to disrupt attacks. So what are you going to do? You're going to go back to the White House and say, ah, oh, we blew it. Sorry. Our bad. Can't do that. You have to go back to the White House and say, we did it. We saved American lives. It's working. That's how you, that's how you justify your massive budget. That's how you justify these crimes that you've committed by telling them that it worked. And that's exactly what they did. So um, what, what kind of message do you think it sends to uh, the battlefields the U.S. is in when word has gotten out that the U.S. has engaged in waterboarding and CIA black sites, secret prisons, um, you know, an indefinite detention at Guantanamo Bay? Does that strike the fear of God into terrorists? Oh, no. No. It makes them more committed to fighting us. And, and like I say, it serves as a recruiting tool. Look what the Americans are doing. They're, they're stepping on... Uh, on the necks of our women with their boots, they're, they're raping uh, our women, they're killing our people, they're murdering our children from the sky. That serves to recruit, not to frighten. 
Yeah, what, you know, I wonder what kind of um, attitude we think, uh, like children who are growing up in Pakistan, Yemen, Somalia, Libya right now, who have lived through uh, bombing Iraq, um, Afghanistan, who have lived through either American occupations or bombings, what will their attitude of the U about the U.S. be when they grow up, when they've heard predator drones buzzing overhead or seen American tanks roll down their street? Mm -hmm. Or we bomb their weddings or we bomb their funerals. You know, we'll, we'll kill an Al-Qaeda fighter and then the whole village will turn out for the funeral and then we bomb the funeral. I mean, that's not how to win friends and influence people. But there, the U.S. policy is we don't assassinate people, right? Obama called them targeted killings. Right. So what's the difference? See, there is no difference. You know, assassinations are supposed to be illegal, right? Um, and in fact, we assassinate people all the time. We have since September the 12th. And that's not going to change. Jeremy Scahill's guy I respect. He talked about like the real scandal in Libya, in Benghazi, wasn't the Republican narrative of Hillary Clinton does not care about American security, and she was ho hum and yawning when they were saying we need more security here, and there's a terrorist threat. The real scandal, according to Scahill, was that sec uh, as uh, Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton supported the bombing of tribal leaders in Libya, and we killed a lot of the wrong people, mm -hmm. and they had a vendetta against America Absolutely. for that. Libya is a very tribally oriented country. Unlike Egypt, which really doesn't have any tribes, Libya is very intensely tribal. The truth is, we had no policy in Libya. Uh, we just sort of jumped on the, the European bandwagon. You know, the, we, we turned on Gaddafi. Like, Gaddafi was a bad guy, but Gaddafi hated Al-Qaeda as much as we did. And certainly Al-Qaeda hated Gaddafi as much as they hate us. Um, we knew that we could work with Gaddafi. We had, um, I have to be careful what I say, a senior CIA officer had made a successful trip to Libya to convince the Libyans to turn over their weapons of mass destruction, which they readily did. And, um, and we were able, I, I'm going to leave it at this, we were able to work with the Libyans, with the Gaddafi government. And then Hillary Clinton just decided one day, as she was jumping on this Arab Spring bandwagon, that we were going to turn and oppose Gaddafi, while at the same time, like you said, bombing Libyan tribes. Well, it's such a tribal society, you can't have a strong central government, which you need, without the support of the tribal leaders. And we murdered the tribal leaders. And then we had to start from scratch. And now Libya is in chaos. And it's all our fault. Hillary Clinton, is it true she was on the kill chain for every targeted killing, whatever you call them, drone I, strikes? I don't know. She signed up on them? I, I don't know. I've heard that. But uh, in my personal experience, at least during the Bush administration, the Secretary of State was not in that chain of command. And Republicans, again, they were investigating Benghazi. They seized on it. I mean, they just jumped to it like it was a horrible scandal. And granted, it was. There was something worth investigating. Four Americans died. There was a bloody attack. Mm -hmm. It's a horrifying situation. And yet they didn't go out. They didn't investigate. And all their invest. I mean, how many thousands of yeah. pages and millions right. of dollars were spent investigating this and all the outrage. The scandal, again, always seemed to be that Hillary Clinton doesn't care about keeping Americans safe. It wasn't anything about um, how yeah. do we like how do we interact with and go to war with um, the Arab world and specifically in Libya. They it seems like they had a, a real uh, like ethical line they could have drawn about you know this is unacceptable here. But of course nobody really expects that. See, and th from this the is the thing they about, went for. Yeah, you're and, right. You're right. They, they went for the for the easy political points. Uh, rather than for the substantive uh, points. I, I agree with you. Um, but the, the bigger issue here, and I think you'll agree, is that she was a terrible Secretary of State. Look at Syria on her watch, Libya on her watch, Egypt on her watch. There was an uprising in Bahrain on her watch. Uh, in the meantime, we're still fighting in Iraq, and we're still fighting in Afghanistan, and we're still fighting in Pakistan and in Somalia. That was all on Hillary Clinton's watch, and it only got worse during Hillary Clinton's tenure as Secretary of State. She seemed to be very hawkish, and not only that... Very hawkish. Very supportive of governments that she eventually turned against. You know, she said she was friends with um, uh, Mubarak in yes. Egypt. He was a good friend. And then of walked right away from him. Right, exactly. You know, uh, uh, And the Obama administration said he should step down. <laughs> yeah, they did. 
They they did. They, they, they walked right away ago. from him. Didn't say that 20 years ago. A I mean, the, granted, different administrations, but America had been allied with him all along, and then uh, it was unacceptable to have him as a leader. Like, what? Yeah. You know, which book are we sort of reading from when uh, yeah. the government does that? Uh, a member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff once told me when I was at the agency that the biggest hawk in any government, and it doesn't matter who the president happens to be, is always the Secretary of State, who is the one person who doesn't have to worry about committing troops, the one person that doesn't have to worry about writing letters to the parents of people killed in action. They're always the ones who are the first to advocate using force, and that was Hillary Clinton. It's uh, interesting that she supported a lot of CIA covert wars and... And, uh, and was very close to John Brennan. Very close, personally. It, it kind of you know, begs the question, you know, why is the CIA involved in this stuff in the first place? Wars have to be declared, right? Right, now, and we haven't declared one since 1941. Yeah, the, and yeah, we, we have a war on terror, but that seems like a global war that can happen anywhere, including within the United States. It can be prosecuted and against American citizens. Um, why is, and, and also we have, you know, what was supposed to be like an emergency power, basically the Patriot Act, mm -hmm. which it seems very hard to remove any emergency power once mm -hmm. it's put in place, um, which is the concern with a lot of people for Trump's uh, immigration ban, mm -hmm. which is oh, it's just going to be a temporary measure yeah. until we figure out, you know, what the hell is going on. Right. Um, is, if you can't figure it out this, like up to this point now, I'm wondering how is he going to figure out, uh, you know, anything any, in a timely manner. But why is the CIA prosecuting this stuff when we have laws that say we should declare war, mm -hmm. you know, Congress must appropriate money, you know, mm -hmm. all, all this stuff. There should be transparency, accountability. Mm -hmm. You're exactly right. Why is the CIA prosecuting these wars? This should be done between the White House and the Defense Department with input from the State Department. This should not be a CIA, this should not be CIA action. And it has been since September 11th. You know, the CIA... The CIA's job really is quite simple. It's to recruit spies to steal secrets and then to analyze those secrets and pass the analysis to the policymaker so that the policymaker can make the best informed policy. Very, very simple. But since September 11th, the CIA has become a paramilitary organization. It's almost like a secret private army um, that deploys around the world to kill people whose politics we don't like. Uh, and I think that's extraordinarily dangerous. I think that's really a no-win kind of policy. And now Republicans, I mean, even like Democrats, but and Republicans, like a lot of neoconservatives like David Frum, William Crystal, seem to be siding with, they'll say it, like the deep state, you know, the CIA, yeah. meaning basically it's almost like a separate government from the elected government. And yes, it may be uh, beneficial in some ways to oppose someone like Trump, but they do seem to be feuding with Trump. Now, what's the danger of having almost this second unelected government that's installed mm -hmm. that uh, that people are siding with now to um, push back against Trump? I said recently in the press um, that the CIA is going to win this fight because the CIA is a is a great big lumbering bureaucracy. The CIA's leadership, not the appointed director, uh, but the people who actually run the CIA on a day-to-day -day basis, have been there for decades, 20, 25, 30 years, and they know they can wait out this president, just like they've waited out other presidents that they didn't like. They didn't like Jimmy Carter. Carter's gone. They're still there. They didn't like Bill Clinton very much. He's gone. They're still there. They know they can wait out Trump and then hope for the best that somebody friendlier to the CIA replaces him, which I think the chances are probably good. And now even for people who oppose Trump under Obama, at some point with an elected government, you have to figure that the other side's going to get power sooner or later. Mm -hmm. So even at the powers they were trusting with Obama, you know, targeted killings, uh, bombings of funerals and weddings, yeah. double tap, uh, signature strikes, um, you know, extraordinary rendition, prosecuting of whistleblowers. Um, it, the, there eventually is going to be somebody that people who supported Obama or if Hillary Clinton was elected, um, that was going, they were going to oppose. 
um, shouldn't they be skeptical, like even when a leader they like has those powers, that eventually someone we're not going to trust is going to yeah. get this power. Maybe the president and the CIA have too much power to prosecute. And that's exactly why you need strong congressional oversight, which we don't have, which we really haven't had since the middle 1980s. Yeah, the, the House and Senate Intelligence Committees have become nothing more than cheerleaders for the CIA. Um, I think that we need somebody with the guts of Frank Church or Otis Pike or Daniel Patrick Moynihan because there's nobody on Capitol Hill right now who has the guts to stand up to the CIA, neither Democrat nor Republican. And what's the solution for people you know, who want um, senators and Congress people who will actually take an adversarial role or, or will just stand up for... Um, the ideas of transparency and congressional oversight. I mean, what's right. a possible solution for them? You know what? I think there is no solution, to tell you the truth. You know, a lot of, a lot of, of Americans think that they have those kinds of representatives. I mean, look at uh, Ron Wyden, Senator Ron Wyden from, uh, from Oregon. He's the uh, ranking Democrat on the Senate Intelligence Committee. And he's supposed to be the guy who's out there fighting the agency, you know, demanding uh, transparency when in fact, you know, Ron Wyden wrings his hands a lot and says, well, you know, I'm personally opposed to a lot of what the agency does, but I can't really say anything because it's classified. And That's not leadership. That's not oversight. We need somebody like Frank Church who's going to say, wait a minute, stop. This is wrong. It's illegal. And because it's illegal and you keep doing it anyway, we're going to have reform. And then he implements reform. That's what oversight is. I think also there's this fear like that um, well, people buy into a mob mentality of if you criticize one candidate or politician, it must mean you're supporting the other. Or right. if you criticize our policy with, say, a dictatorship, you support that. That's what the Iraq, in the Iraq war, there was so much talk of you know, people not being patriotic. Oh, you must love Saddam. Mm -hmm. You support him. You know, Sean Penn visited yeah. Iraq and said, oh, he must you know, yeah. love uh, Saddam Hussein, who was a brutal dictator. Mm -hmm. So when somebody like Hillary Clinton runs, you know, she supported the Iraq war. And here she is running on the Democratic Party. And by the way, I was, it was interesting how many times they invoked Ronald Reagan. Right. Like Tim Kaine was invoking right. Ronald Reagan. Ridiculous. And, like that didn't used to be, they used to pile on Reagan for, you know, the age of greed and, you know, uh, demonizing the poor and yeah. gay people and, yeah. you know, raping the environment. Exactly. And he, so now they're, they are the democratic party are the ones invoking Reagan now. And, um, they, they nominated Hillary Clinton who yeah. voted for the use of force in Iraq and sort of used two arguments for why, like, it's mm -hmm. okay that she, which is one, she now regrets the decision. It was a mistake. Like, oops, you know, do over. I can be trusted starting now, mm -hmm. but also that she didn't really understand what the vote was for, mm -hmm. even though she, she was on the congressional floor, Senate floor arguing for And a member the of vote. the foreign relations committee. Yeah. So therefore, but so therefore, we should trust her again, and she's supposed to be the opposition. It seems like you know there's bipartisan support for these programs. It's just which flavor do you want? You know, do you want the uh, crazy strongman Mussolini? See, type that, that's of why that's why I went third party, because there's no difference between the two major parties. No difference. I mean, you can sort of play around the edges a little bit, but when when push comes to shove, the policies are identical. They keep conceding to the other party because in yeah. the end, I think. Even Obama, okay, you saw at the end of his administration, one of the issues you've dealt with, you've been uh, uh, pushing for is prison reform. Mm -hmm. Well, he did some prison, prison reform, criminal justice reform measures towards the end of he his tried. administration. Yeah. A little bit, he pardoned prisoners. Yeah, but that's he, not reform. He was bottled up, actually, by the, uh, by the Republicans in the Senate and um, was unable to actually push through legislation that would have reduced mandatory minimum sentences. Uh, he tried and pardoned, spoke up for pardoned him. and commuted a lot of sentences. Yeah. But even so, he waited until the end the of very the second end. term. Yeah, and which leads me to believe that even though he had, he wasn't worried about being reelected. He had to help ensure that the next Democrat yes. would be elected. Yes, and that's always going to be a problem when you have two monolithic parties. Yes, which is they're going to make sure we don't. For instance, there's going to be a bad precedent if you impeach the other party's president. Because eventually you want your party to be elected, your party's candidate to be elected, and you don't want that person to be impeached if they do something that's maybe just as shady or just as illegal. Yes. Um, how do you? So what's the? How do you even um, 
push for a change within these parties that basically they keep having to concede things to each other. It's like a game they're playing with each other. I, you know what? I don't to know. Keep power. I, I don't know the answer. I, I think both parties have become so internally corrupted that I, I'm not sure there's an easy fix for something like that. Jeremy Scahill proposed uh, that um, candidates, when they're at debates, they should wear suits like NASCAR drivers with their sponsors. All over them. I think that's a pretty good. <laughs> that's idea. great. That's a great idea. Yeah, because I mean, if you don't get the money out of these campaigns, you can't run unless you're rich. Yeah, basically. that's it. You need a billion dollars to run for president. What do you have that you're working on that you know people um, can look up and? I have a. I have two books coming out. I have one called. Uh, um, the Convenient Terrorist, Abu Zubaydah and the Weird Wonderland of America's Secret Wars. I wrote it with Joe Hickman, who was a Guantanamo guard who guarded Abu Zubaydah. And so we go in great detail through the hunt for Abu Zubaydah, the capture, the torture, the interrogation, and the incarceration of Abu Zubaydah. It's supposed to be the definitive Abu Zubaydah book. That's coming out on March 11th. And then I have a, a book that's much more fun um, that's coming out May 16th called uh, Doing Time Like a Spy, How the CIA Taught Me to Survive and Thrive in Prison. I wrote a series of blogs from prison called Letters from Loretto that were published by firedoglake.com and then carried by the Huffington Post. And so I, uh, I incorporate those letters into the book and I show how I used 20 life lessons that the CIA taught me to keep myself safe in prison and to try to remain at the top of the social heap. You know, the, the judge ordered that I be sent to a minimum security work camp. Work camp, there are no bars on the windows, no barbed wire, you're free to come and go as you please, you're just on your honor not to abscond. And when I got to prison, um, they took me to the actual prison and I said, no, no, I'm supposed to be at the camp across the street. And the cop said, not according to my paperwork, you're not. It took me five days to get access to a phone and I called my attorney and I said, hey, they put me in the actual prison. And he said, wow, well, we can file a motion, but it'll take us two years before we get a hearing and you'll be home by then. He said, I'm sorry, you're going to have to tough it out. And so I, I really had to rely on my training to make sure that I could, uh, I could do that successfully. And I did. Um, and so for people viewing this, I'll link to several things uh, you were involved with below, like uh, your column that you write, and also the documentary Silenced, uh, right. which is where I first, um, well, I, I knew of your story before that, but I first really got to see all the details about it. Um, yeah, Silenced actually came out in, what was it, 2014. It premiered at the uh, Tribeca Film Festival, and here we are, 2017, and it's still on Netflix, it's still on iTunes, it's, it's all over the place. There was just a show... Uh, of it a couple of nights ago in Stockholm. It's taken on a life of its own in Europe. Yeah, so, so it's out there. Yeah, I'll, I'll, so I'll link to that uh, below. Um, and uh, so I did, I, I remember, I did want to mention one last thing about, you mentioned uh, third party votes. That automatically gets the charge of, well, you support, you're lending support to Donald Trump. Or yeah. Whoever wins, because it's a thrown away vote. Yeah, but that's assuming that I otherwise would have voted for Hillary Clinton, which I would not have. So it wasn't a vote for Donald Trump. But how is how is criticizing Hillary Clinton, who uh, is much saner at least uh, than Trump, uh, and maybe domestic policy? See, but I uh, thought Hillary Clinton was far more dangerous on on national security policy than Donald Trump. Far more dangerous. She's proven. She has proven to us in her years uh, as Secretary of State and and in the United States Senate to be an utter disaster, a warmongering disaster when it comes to national defense, foreign policy, and intelligence policy. So you know, there's always this assumption that a vote for a third party is a vote for Trump because people would otherwise have voted for Hillary. I would never have voted for Hillary Clinton, never. I wouldn't have voted for Trump either, but I would never have voted for Hillary Clinton. You gotta vote for who you believe in because like I said, a vote for the lesser of two evils is still evil. What about uh, the idea that um, Hillary Clinton and Obama's administration sort of, and even before them, George Bush, like basically Obama inherited George Bush's powers. Mm -hmm. Now uh, Trump has it inherited Obama's. Mm -hmm. There's this continual succession of powers that keep building up war powers and spying powers yes. and you know uh, uh, court powers with each administration that basically 
Trump was going to inherit mm -hmm. Obama's perils, and yet towards the end of Obama's administration, he didn't. He, for all his talk of how Trump, dangerous Trump was, he kept ratcheting them up. He didn't seem to be putting, you know, safeguarding everything. Like, okay, now we're out of office. Now a lunatic's going to be in charge. We can't let him get access to all this stuff. For people, people who say, you know, vote for a third party is wasted, or even voicing criticism to uh, Democrats is wasted because you're lending some credence to Trump. Again, this mob mentality. Uh, what do you have to say about the fact that each administration seems to be bar bi increasingly bipartisan in handing over yeah. huge amounts of war powers? And Trump is dangerous da development. Granted, Trump is turning that in a so new, even more dangerous direction mm -hmm. than Obama. Um, however, Obama knew his, like we all knew his entire um, uh, presidency, the two terms, that somebody like Trump could be elected at some point. I don't think any of us expected it. No. I was wrong about that. No. A lot of people were. But at some point, some, someone, some president is going to inherit that power. And like Edward Snowden said, we'll have a turnkey dictatorship. Yeah. I think Snowden's exactly right. This is a, a terrible system that we've carved out for ourselves. And you're right. It's just, it's just one authoritarian president after the other. It makes no difference if that president's a Democrat or a Republican. So you're saying we need a true sort of like, um, uh, we need to reform our ideas. We just... need to reform our ideas. We need for, for the congressional oversight committees to stand up for what they're supposed to do. We need members of Congress to realize that they are an independent branch of government and they're not supposed to march in lockstep with the uh, administration, whoever the administration happens to be headed by. Um, we need the courts to stand up and, and they actually are standing up, at least on these national security issues lately. But yeah, you know, we've, we've gotten to the point, our domestic politics have gotten to the point where we've convinced ourselves that we're all supposed to be cooperating with one another and we're not. You know, each branch of government has a separate function and a separate goal, and they just don't seem to be exercising those functions. Well, right, and people so often say, depending on who's in leadership, before it was Democrats would say it with Obama, now Republicans and the alt right would say it with Trump, which is you have to support the president, don't be so divisive. You're right. being divisive right. when you're constantly in the streets, you know, irrationally angry. That's the term I hear is irrational anger against Trump. Mm -hmm. Um, from people who are much smarter than Trump, by the way, I hear it from right-wing pundits. I listen to a lot of right-wing radio. All these guys are smarter than Trump. Like Mark Levin, you know, he, yeah. he was in the Reagan administration. Right. He's a smart guy. I don't agree with him on pretty much anything. Yeah. But he's clearly a sane, you know, intelligent person, a person I could have a conversation with who, who probably hasn't done things like Trump has to business partners and contractors. Well, he'll just casually, like a sociopath, rip people off and... And we can, by the way, we could imagine in the campaign what Trump would do with that power, mm -hmm. how he abuses power once he became president. But people are saying now, don't be so divisive. It's time to, you know, support Trump. What do you have to say to that? When they're saying, you know, it's like we're all one family, like we're all one nation, one house. And you can't be so divisive with Trump. He's trying uh, to lead us. Right. But where is he leading us? So we're just supposed to line up behind Trump when he wants to bomb Yemen, for example, or line up behind Trump when he wants to just arbitrarily ban people from coming to the United States, or line up behind Trump and his stupid wall, or you know, line up behind Trump when he orders the Customs and Border Protection to start seizing Americans' uh, cell phone passwords and social media passwords at the border or at airports? No, we have to fight, we have to resist. And if Congress isn't gonna represent us, and help us, then we have to do it ourselves. And that path was paved by the administration that prosecuted you, right? Without the a doubt. The Obama administration. Barack Obama was the greatest enemy of transparency that we have had in modern times.